to have you here today. Um, we will have to apologize. Susan pre-recorded some videos, but we couldn't get them to play. We're still having those problems we had earlier. Um, so we're not going to have the piano this week, but we'll be back next week with the piano and everything else. But Mark is still here, and he will still sing the song, so we will still have music for us today. So I'm happy that you all have invited me into your living rooms, your back porches, anywhere that you may be watching this service, and I hope that you find it to be meaningful and impactful. Thank you. with us as we sing this morning our hymn, I am thine, O Lord. You'll find the words on your screen as we sing together, I am thine, O Lord. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn with thee. where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, thy power of grace divine. Let my soul steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, Blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. As we continue our worship this morning, let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, we ask that as we gather today, wherever we may be, you grant us the opportunity to be illumined by your word and sacraments, that we may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, and that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. I believe that vanilla ice cream is the best flavor. I think Charles Dickens is the most entertaining author. I think that you should treat other people with kindness and that you shouldn't cut your grass on Sundays. I believe that you don't necessarily need to buy anything if you're just browsing in a bookstore, but you probably will. I believe you should always go to a funeral if you're able, 
even if you don't know the person well. And I believe that Jesus is our Savior. Now, some of you might disagree with me on a few of those beliefs, and hopefully you all agree with that last one. Some of my beliefs might seem a little bit silly, while others are quite serious. In general, beliefs are a bit odd like that. Sometimes there's something that's truly important, and other times they really don't matter. Likewise, sometimes our beliefs are formed for very silly reasons. Um, I like vanilla ice cream because we only had two choices of ice cream in elementary school, vanilla or chocolate. And I can't eat chocolate, so vanilla ice cream, by default, became my favorite. Um, and I just haven't had a reason to question that belief since then. But other beliefs come from something deeper. They're more meaningful. They actually make a difference in our life. And today, we're going to read about one of those beliefs today. We're going to be, read about Nathaniel, one of the 12 of Jesus' disciples, and about how he formed the belief that Jesus was our Savior. So join with me today as we read from John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and he who the prophets also wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than that. And Jesus continued, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This scripture is the first time that Nathanael is presented to us in the Gospel of John. And it's the longest account we have of Nathanael, or how the other Gospels refer to him as Bartholomew, Bartholomew, that we find anywhere in the New Testament, which makes this interaction important because it gives us an insight into who Nathanael was, which makes Nathanael's first belief in this narrative important. And what's interesting about this belief is that it's incorrect. And, and no, his first belief was not that Jesus was the Son of God or the King of Israel. No, his very first belief was, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? The first thing we know about Nathaniel is that he doesn't like people from Nazareth. And maybe we have a bit of a something in common with that. I mean, how many people here think about no good Kentucky or Louisville or Ohio State or Alabama fans? Or, or what about how we in Kentucky sometimes view people in New York or California as a bit too slick? And how people in New York and California sometimes view us as a little bit backwards? I'm, I've heard plenty of people fall into those sort of ways of thinking, um, especially with the UK and the U of L debate. And to someone on the outside, these sort of generalizations can seem, well, a bit absurd. But I have to say that I've been known from time to time to make judgments about people that I've seen decked head to toe in Alabama gear. These beliefs that we hold are just kind of incorrect without any sound principle behind them 
but yet they're just something that we've grown up with. They're like my belief in vanilla ice cream. It's just something that we've, well, happened into. But while my sports team analogy is really quite harmless, there's other beliefs we have that really don't line up for God's expectations of us. I mean, often religious beliefs are connected to these harmful beliefs that do not come from God. I mean, it doesn't take much examination to find Christians who've done evil things against the Spirit of God because they felt some sort of belief connecting to their religion. I mean, people like Eric Rudolph, the person who committed the bombings at the Olympics in Atlanta, felt that he was called by God to protect white Christianity. He thought that God wanted him to murder innocent people. His belief was not from God, the creator of all good. His belief was evil. And his belief, even though, was held deeply. It was something that he thought was true, even though it wasn't. And to anyone else, we could see that belief was obviously not from God. But he couldn't. Because it's hard for us to figure out what a true belief from God is and something that we've just picked up over the years. Because to us, they often feel equally true. So it's important for us not only to look at our bad beliefs, but also to examine our good beliefs. Because the second belief that Nathaniel has is a good belief. And that good belief he has helps him overcome his bad belief. It replaces the belief that nothing good can come from Nazareth. He declares, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. To which Jesus replies, you believe. Nathan went from believing that nothing good could come from Nazareth to believing that a man in whom all good comes from came from Nazareth. He changed his belief, and that allowed him to follow Jesus. But I have a, a bit of a problem with this scripture here, and it's that it really doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand how Nathan decided to change his belief. In fact, the whole interaction to me doesn't quite make sense as a reader. I just don't know why Jesus said Nathanael was an Israelite in whom there was no deceit. It just doesn't, it's not what's presented to us. Nothing makes us think that that's true. I mean, we don't know much about Nathanael, and he doesn't seem like necessarily a deceitful or sly kind of guy, but he doesn't seem like a great guy either. I mean, the only information we have about him is that he's, well, a little bit racist about people who come from Nazareth. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me why Jesus would turn around and say that you're such an amazing Israelite because he doesn't seem like one. And unfortunately, I can't give you an answer on why Jesus did what he did. We don't know if Jesus saw Philip under that fig tree, either in person physically, or maybe it was some sort of divine vision he had while Nathaniel was alone. I mean, equally, the idea that he was under a fig tree could indicate that Nathaniel was studying scripture, or it could equally indicate that he was doing something sinful. I mean, we don't know so much about this moment. And in some ways, it's a bit of a, a writing in the sand kind of moment referring to the time that Jesus was confronted by a mob who was planning to stone an adulterous woman. And he wrote something in the sand in front of this mob, something that is not recorded in the New Testament. We can only guess at what he, what he wrote. And then upon finishing writing, the whole crowd gathered there stood without throwing a stone. No one stoned this woman. We are left wondering, what did Jesus write in the sand that made this mob not throw a stone at this woman? Often, people assume that he was writing a list of sins that these people had committed in private, 
in front of them all, showing that no one there was without sin, which is a possibility. And I wonder if this moment we read about today of Nathaniel being under that fig tree and Jesus seeing him by some way was not like that. Is Jesus saying that you are an Israelite in whom there is not deceit as a way of poking fun at Nathaniel? Because there's quite a bit of sarcasm that Jesus says in the New Testament. Um, we find quite a pointed example later in the Gospel of John in chapter 10, verses 32, 31 through 32, where it says, His Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone Jesus. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Okay, it's a bit of a dry wit, but it's there. I have to wonder if this isn't kind of like that moment. Was Nathaniel plotting? Was he being crafty, sly, and deceitful under that fig tree? Was he secretly planning on stealing another fisherman's fish or planning on stealing another man's wife? Was he doing something sinful under the tree? And was Jesus calling him out for that sin without letting the people around him know what Nathaniel did? I mean, fig trees have been associated with many things, but they are often associated with things that are not good and quite deceitful. The forbidden fruit that Adam and Eve consumed, while commonly thought of as an apple, it, it's not. A apples were not in the Middle East in the time of the Old Testament. However, figs were. And fig leaves are what Adam and Eve used to clothe themselves in the Garden of Ebel, Ebel, Eden after consuming the plant, the, the forbidden fruit. In fact, before the Renaissance, most Jewish scholars assumed that the fig was the forbidden fruit. The fig back then was associated with this initial act of deceit, which makes you wonder, was Nathaniel being deceitful underneath this tree which is known for deceit? I can imagine Jesus calling out to Nathanael, saying that you are truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. As Nathanael walks up with glassy eyes, knowing the truth. When examining the scripture in that light, I gain a little bit more of a sense at why Nathanael would change his mind. Jesus was able to point out to him how Nathaniel was not as good as he thought he was, and how his life could be better. Not, not good in a sense that's monetary or socially, but maybe Nathaniel ethically wasn't as good as he could have been. And by showing Nathaniel that, that is where the change in belief comes from. He goes from his bad beliefs of the past to an understanding of what is good with Jesus. And he can become truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Uh, stories like this of change don't just happen in the Bible. I mean, when I think of someone's changed belief, I'm drawn to George Wallace, the third longest serving governor in the United States. He served several times as the governor of Alabama during the civil rights era. And he often makes history textbooks but not because of his length of tenure as governor, but instead as his opposition to integration. He has the infamous quote that you've probably heard before, in the name of the greatest people who have ever trot this earth, I draw a line in the dust and toss down the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say, segregation now, segregation Tomorrow, segregation forever. Just reading that quote makes my skin crawl, especially with my own understanding of my experiences attending an integrated public school. And George Wallace 
was not just waxing poetic when he, when he said these words. He held true to this notion. He fought integration at every turn, keeping black children out of schools and running some of the most blatantly racist campaigns in American political history, including the campaigns that led up to the Civil War. Then, while he was campaigning for president, George Wallace was shot. And while recovering from that injury, he changed some of his beliefs. He found himself becoming a born-again Christian. He found a Christian faith in his life that had been dormant before. And in that new Christian belief, he found an understanding. During his last tenure as governor, he appointed more black members to cabinet positions than any governor of Alabama had done in the past. And he apologized to the black civil rights leaders that he had wronged, saying point blank, I was wrong. He changed his beliefs from bad to good because of Christ. Now, I'm not going to say that he was a saint. He, he was a politician and had political aims. And while there was changes to his beliefs, there was also changes to the beliefs in our country, and those beliefs that he held in the past were much less popular now. But it was good for him to recognize the beliefs he had and for him to correct them with his faith in Christ, just as Nathaniel changed his belief from a man in Nazareth. But just changing your beliefs is not nearly enough because belief without action is dead. You have to replace your new belief and move forward with Christ to replace the sins you've had in the past. I mean, maybe you were dependent on something before, or maybe you don't think that you can find joy with other people, or maybe you think that everyone in the world is out to get you, or that maybe you're too concerned with money. You have to replace those old beliefs with a new belief in Christ and then act upon that new belief that you have. I mean, we don't know much from Nathaniel in the Bible, but we do know that after this interaction, he continued with Jesus, and he was one of Jesus' 12 disciples until the end. He was one of the witnesses to the resurrection. And then we know also from the traditions that were handed down by Christians over the ages outside of the Bible, that he supposedly traveled to India, where he preached the gospel there. He traveled to what was the end of the known world to him, to preach gospel to people that were very different than him. When just a few years earlier, he had these prejudiced views about people who lived only a few miles from his home. He grew, and with his new belief, he acted upon it and grew into a person that he wasn't before. So I have to ask you, are you acting on your good beliefs in Christ? Do you act on your beliefs as much as you act on other beliefs? Do you act on the belief you have in Christ more than your belief in vanilla ice cream being the best flavor? I mean, there's people with no religious beliefs at all Yet, sometimes they act on their beliefs and no beliefs more than Christians act on their true beliefs. Uh, there's a group of atheists that have no belief that they say, profess that wear pasta strainers on their heads during their driver's license photos. They do it to protest that religious groups like the sheiks can wear their religious head garb and, pro and driver's license photos while they can't wear hats. Yes. They want to wear hats and driver's license photos so badly that they put a pasta strainer on their head. Yet, as silly as their actions might be, do Christians have as much passion about our true beliefs as they have about theirs? Would you be willing to inconvenience yourself to follow Jesus? I mean, would you help someone else if that meant that you had to sacrifice something of your own? Are you even willing to call someone and to tell them that they are loved and that Christ loves them too, just like you do? Just having a belief, even a good belief, is not enough if you don't act upon it. 
We must be like Nathaniel. We must follow Christ and accept the true belief in God. And that allows us to overcome the beliefs of our past that are taking up space in our hearts and pulling us down. We must be peacemakers in this time of turmoil. Like Nathaniel, we must follow Jesus. We must follow Jesus and make peace, love, and kindness known to all. Now, will you pray with me today? Almighty God, grant us your wisdom. Allow us to have the knowledge of what is holding us back from being our full selves. What beliefs do we hold on to when we no longer need to? Give us your divine inspiration so that we can move past them, move past the, our past selves, and move into a fuller connection with you and your son Jesus. That we can accept the belief in Christ as our Savior and act upon it to show your love this side of the Jordan. Amen. For his gift. 
often, beliefs are an individual thing. We have beliefs of our own, like mine and vanilla ice cream, or Charles Dickens is the best author. They're things that I hold true and I share with myself. But the belief at this table isn't. This is a belief that connects us with believers around the world throughout the ages. We're connected with Nathaniel, connected to that first, last supper in that upper room where those men came together with a shared belief, a belief that we hold to today. So I invite you, no matter where you are on your journey with Christ, to join us at this table with our shared beliefs as we partake in this holy meal. For the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and having blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and after he poured it, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, given to you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear God, you disclose the ideal life in Jesus Christ. Forgive us as we think that we have heard your voice, but in reality, we've only heard our own. Forgive us when we think that we are doing your will, but we are really doing ours. Break through the crust of our self-righteousness and expose our rationality. Stir us to repent, to be truly sorrowful, and to convey through these elements your true love and true belief. And your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I'd like to thank you for worshiping with us today, and I'd like to ask something of you. If you Google our church, we have four reviews. <laughs> there are four mostly positive reviews. They're good reviews, but there's only four of them. And when people come to our church, the first thing they see is our Google search results. Whether they're Googling us to see if we're a church that fits them or if they're putting us in their GPS to come here in person, those four reviews are the first interaction they have with our church. So what I'm asking you to do is to go onto Google right now, as soon as you're done watching this, and write us a review of what you think. Flood the internet with good reviews of our church. Make it a flood greater than that that Noah had. Make it a flood of good reviews so that people know the love, compassion, and kindness that you have experienced here at Hurstborn Christian Church, either if you've attended here in person or whether you've attended online. And I'd like to thank you in advance for doing that. But now, let's close together in a prayer. Now, may the Spirit of God surround you. May the peace of God be in your heart. And may you share that peace with each and every person you meet. Amen.